First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of the conference uh, for inviting me to come to speak. Uh, although I should emphasize that the talk this evening is not connected, in a sense, to uh, the conference which starts tomorrow, and I'll be speaking more directly about Jacques Derrida, uh, I think, on Saturday. Um, but I was invited to to talk about, not about architectural history in general, but the more narrow case of teaching architectural history within an architectural school, <clears throat> which seems to me a genuinely different <clears throat> question. Now, I don't want to take up more than the time I've been given, so you'll forgive me that some of the argument is uh, kind of simplified and shortened, because it's really part of a much longer uh, argument. And I'll try to express what might have appeared in a more theoretical argument in a more direct and perhaps anecdotal way. <clears throat> I'm struck that when you go around architecture schools giving lectures, there's usually, when you meet the faculty, there's usually somebody, could be a man, could be a woman, who you notice looks very depressed. I've discovered it's a universal rule that you've just identified the person who teaches history and theory. <laughs> You all go out to dinner. They're quite used now to sitting by themselves. They look a kind of combination or by turn <clears throat> sad and somewhat bitter. Because at a certain level, they don't know what they're doing there. They got given the job. The courses are on the syllabus. They came to do it. But after the appointment, no one wants to discuss what they do, <clears throat> especially the students. You know, you thought the faculty were bad, but the students are awful. They don't even come. I mean, if we had true figures of attendance at history and theory lectures, I say true ones because the teachers, history and theory teachers are, I mean, masters of altering figures. Uh, they should be hired by Wall Street. <coughs> um, No, they didn't come. The students say, why do we have to go to the history lectures? They're nothing to do with what they came for. They wanted to learn design. After a while, even the miserable teacher realizes they've got a point. What am I doing here? They came because presumably in some way they were interested in contemporary design. That's what they want to do. That's the, they wouldn't mind studying that. So why, you know, it's week three And we're still on the pyramids. What, what, what's it for? 
And it's a point. I mean, some trainings would be much more direct. I don't definitely have any special knowledge, but I assume that if you want to be a dentist, and you're a student in the first year of dentistry, you don't say, oh God, it's Tuesday, we're supposed to go to the history of dentistry. Why would you teach dentists the history of dentistry? So they don't come, but they have an obligation, perhaps, to do an essay. That's bleak. I spent more time than I would like to acknowledge <coughs> saying, what would you like your history essay to be on? And sometimes at the AA you'd be met with complete silence. And for reasons I don't understand, in the 80s, when it finally became so embarrassing, you say, well, what? I mean, just something. They would say, Japanese garden. And you say, what? The Japanese garden. It completely changed in the 90s. You'd end up asking the same question. And they'd say, body and architecture. History of. Kind of got depressing. You know, you really want someone to come in your room and they're so bored with you that all they can say is Japanese garden. I don't know anything about Japanese gardens. Anyway. But actually, the truth is that if you look at all these bodies, which kind of certify, like in England, the syllabus has to be looked at by the Royal Institute of British Architects, probably the one course you couldn't get rid of would be history. <clears throat> you know how when you put people into a, a meeting, the first thing is they lose is their capacity for thought. So they say, history is very important. And the next one says, that's exactly what I've always said. So you go around the table of these important people who set the syllabus, and they will probably say somewhere, that it'll be printed somewhere, Reba, the Royal Institute of British Architects, places the highest possible value on the institution giving a good, it's not just background, it's more than that, in architectural history. Sometimes when they come to inspectors and you find yourself having coffee with them, I say, you say this about history. They say, yes, we're very, very, very strong on our commitment to history. You say, why? Yes. Uh, and then he looks at the other one and say, why, why, are we so, uh, why are we so committed to history? Hello? <laughs> <coughs> The other one says, well, it's the same in anything. I mean, history is of fundamental importance. So you say, yes, but my question was, why? Yes, well, obviously it is. Uh, occasionally, they say, well, because without a knowledge of history, we are condemned to repeat it. So then you think for architects, that's an odd argument. Normally to teach the past is because you'd like people to imitate it. 
I mean, the history of architecture is recommendations that you should imitate the past. So if we don't study it, we just repeat them, fine. We'll just go on doing what they did. Uh, so it's difficult to see how that makes a difference. It's one of those strange cultural moments when you know they're lying. Or, I mean, it, it came up actually when we had an examination last year. The, uh, the person who said this, I shall not reveal his identity. He was uh, told to look at the history and theory stuff for the final examiners. He said, I think history is very important. It's vital that students know about the Roman Agora. So I said, yeah, it's vital they know about the Greek Forum as well. Uh, I mean, it's a strange moment when someone is saying they've got to know about it and then gets it wrong. So it's quite strange. Uh, that's one thing. A certain kind of, you might almost call it a kind of comedy at the level of students Students don't want to write their history essays. When they do, they don't show a great love, or since Wikipedia, a great knowledge of the topic. I remember the one who talked about Michelangelo but it was always two words. It was Michael Angelo. You know, you felt like he had a brother called Giuseppe Angelo. Uh, maybe it was the same person who wrote an essay in the exam for a friend of mine who taught economics, who said, under socialism, everyone will have an above average income. <laughs> that was quite sweet, actually. <laughs> I think that was probably what we did think. Uh, now, I want to sort of, I want you to carry on hearing that world and then focus a bit more carefully. As we know, many courses and I realize now that people will say, well, but it's changed so much, it's changed so much. My experience is when people say, you know, the guarantee that it hasn't changed is when people say it's changed enormously in the last 10 years. It's like if you want to, you know, to know that you're just about to hear a real error, it's always prefaced by the phrase, recent research has shown that. And you're guaranteed that it's awful. And then they say it's completely changed now. Nonetheless, I'm going to use an older example where everyone, certainly in the UK, used to teach architectural history by reference to what was known as the survey course. Like maybe two years of kind of going from the pyramids to Zaha. Maybe and back again. Uh, now, it's important to recognize what people were getting when they got a survey course or something like it. They weren't being really taught anything about architecture. They were being taught something about periodization. Right? in such a course, what you were basically giving the student was so that you would sort of know and sort of recognize what's the Greek. You know, if you want to, you'd, you'd 
have an architectural version of Winkelmann and you'd have sort of archaic Greek architecture, uh, classical Greek architecture, Hellenistic Greek architecture, and then Helleno-Romano architecture, and then imperial Roman architecture, and then second sophistic kind of return of the Greeks. It was all about a kind of period. And in a sense, this was like a little, a, little, a little machine you had which would allow you to roughly identify the period and style. So it's important to indicate, in, as it were, where this obsession with period and style comes from, or really it's period as style. I suppose for ease of exposition, we could think of someone like Bur Burkhardt in the 19th century, who was a kind of historian and a sort of poor man's Hegelian. Um, he wanted the dialectic somehow, but without it getting anywhere. Uh, so, in his text on the Renaissance, he really is arguing that there's a period, like 1400 to whenever, which we might call the Renaissance. As a, it has a certain cultural identity, and it has a certain cultural unity. So, everything within it in a way, logically refers to everything else in it. It's what the philosopher Louis Althusser would <clears throat> characterize as an expressive totality. So if you built in 1450, you know, it's going to be like, if you built a building in 1450, it's going to be sort of like music in 1450. And there are famous examples of that kind of reasoning, such as Panofsky's article on the relationship between st uh, stained glass, Gothic, Gothic architecture and legal philosophy. So the important thing really was going through these periods. That's what people were really, in effect, learning. The central category is the question of style. In this sense, architectural history, as it became a kind of as it became a recognized discipline in the mid-19th century, was really this theory of the period as made essential in its style, and the style being visible signs which you could then classify the Renaissance, mannerism, the Baroque, etc. Now, there was always a problem giving this to architectural students. This is where we return to the question of the architectural school. Because even if you were devoted as an architect to architecture of the past, it's not clear that your sole and singular interest would be that of style. But the kind of books that get written, like for the survey, the way in which in the 20th century and the late 19th century, publishers you know, like Yale or Oxford or whatever start putting out these large authoritative series, I think it's quite linked into a publisher's uh, calculation. These books are very little 
uh, adjusted to things that might interest the student. They're not very interested in construction. They're not very interested in materials. So there's always been a level of kind of criticism, and then, as it were, those generated the books on the history of construction methods or the history of the use of materials. They became a kind of subset of architectural history. This was inherited very much by the art historian Verflin. And if we could just look for five minutes at Verflin's practice, we're able to see something else about what was being taught under the rubric of architectural history in a kind of survey form. And it is as a survey form because it's important for architecture. It's not just accidental that people say, I'm going to write something on the history of architecture. It is, and I'll come back to this later, the attempt to provide the profession with a dignified past. Right? You can see this happen in the 19th century more evidently, even more evidently, when suddenly, in a sense, with the professionalization of medicine, as a kind of sub-branch of medicine, you get the development of the history of medicine, which really, in a sense, didn't systematically have a history. Now, Verflin's influence, which was great, corresponded to the moment when architecture, architectural history began to be set up as departments or small units of an architecture school, told to teach architectural history. But look for a moment at what they're doing. Now, Verflin is the first lecturer his lectures in architectural history were very popular. In, this was after he moved from Basel to uh, Berlin. Were very popular because he was the first person to show two slides, as it were, at the same time. And if you want to know like the difference between the Renaissance and the Baroque. He kind of lists them as categories, like one is planimetric in its representation of distance, the other is recessional, and so we go through them. But the most convincing way of doing it is to put up, you know, a very quattrocento-ish church against the very Baroque church, and everyone goes, my God, the professor is right. Isn't that amazing? It's really little more than a trick. It's a trick to induce this idea of period as style, take two particularly photogenic examples of them and put them up on the wall. I say photogenic for a deliberate reason. Because, in a way, the corpus of those courses on architectural history weren't actually buildings. They were photos of buildings. In a sense, the entire, what you might call, tannum of architecture is built really on a photographic archive 
of really very few buildings, right? I've got no fundamental, as it were, objection to that, except we should be clear about what we're doing. The idea that this was a sort of cross-section of mm. building in Europe or wherever else uh, is clearly ridiculous. I've tried to show then, or suggest, that this form of pedagogy, this, this pedagogic objective, is not really appropriate to architects at all, right? Now, I want to begin to turn towards a, a kind of reformulation of what it is that we are interested in. Now, one thing which I noticed quite soon, organizing architectural teaching, is that certain architectural experiences are in a way excluded by the, um, the survey course, the period, the style. It would seem to me a very valuable thing to know what, how architects experienced architecture. So, for example, we've all read the experiences of Le Corbusier, looking at architecture in Athens or in Istanbul. But somehow, that had no place in the history of architecture. Actually, the periodization actually was so narrow in its focus that it, it always thought like the building is finished, you know, soon after the building was started, even though we know as a fact that's not particularly true. In the case of Gothic cathedrals, as a project, it wasn't just that the money dried up in the treasury. It was these were supposed to be projects which would unfold over a very, very long time. So we can say that surely then that the experience of architects looking at architecture is important, but it doesn't count as architectural history. But in my view, it must count. And so what, it is, what is it, in a sense, that Corb is looking at? Let me try and make, begin to make a distinction here, which is then vital for the argument. Let's put architecture and its history on one side, and architecture on its past on the other side. So I'm distinguishing history from the past. And I will need in a moment to take a few minutes to explain what I mean by this difference. <clears throat> what does it mean to differentiate architectural history from the architectural past? Perhaps as a way of uh, attempting to explain this, let's take the, uh, the, the issue not immediately about architecture, <coughs> but of ourselves.
to what would be called of the subject. Now, everyone sitting in this room has both, everyone sitting in this room has a history, but they also have a past. Everyone in this room, on the assumption that they're either a teacher or a student in the university, there is a file somewhere that says who you are. And in it will roughly be what is called your CV. Your CV is made up of what you might call public facts. Things that have to be public in order to have an existence. That you have a certain name, that you live at a certain address, and that you've been places to be educated, and you've done certain things, and you won a prize, etc. I group it all together as something like a public fact. Right? And we have a very clear notion of what would be something that is true, maybe, but should never appear on your CV. You look quizzical. Uh, you wouldn't expect to see on someone's CV, like, uh, you know, and a terrible lover. Um, you know, it's, it's, we would think that was, it shouldn't be there. Uh, but when you read, I'm sure almost everybody in the room, unless they unless they have criminal predispositions, uh, everyone, when they read the CV, has almost a feeling of guilt, because they recognize somehow that this is not true. But it is true. What they mean by that is it leaves out everything you'd rather not talk about. Now, if you say, then, that there are public facts, and those make up something like a history, there are also non-public, let's not even call them facts, but there is stuff you either don't want to talk about, don't have a way to talk about, or don't even know that it's there except some vague notion that there's something not quite right. This, I don't know, uh, how it works in serbo croat but in English, the term the past has a sort of double meaning. It's both has a, a kind of temporal sense, but also it's like a realm of difficulty. If you say someone has a past, it has the the meaning which is used by Oscar Wilde when he says every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. Um, the past then really is like the difficulty. What is it that's particularly difficult 
I mean, there's no difficulty with being criminal. If you're completely happy with it, it's on the contrary. It can be extremely functional. But if you keep getting yourself into the same situation, thinking, God damn it, I'm here again, that's where the past is not only something from the, the past, temporally, but it's where it's determining something in the present. So, in a sense, let's imagine this is not only, it's evidently true of people. The question is, is it even plausibly true of architecture? What are, what are the kind of thresholds of what you can talk about, about architecture? I don't mean talking about something else. What is it that you think might be true, but too stupid? I mean, probably stupidity is, is the way in which educational institutions control the boundaries of what's allowed to be said and count as a contribution to the class. Why, why don't you leave the class? <clears throat> Sometimes students do have a feeling of being on the verge of saying something but inhibited immediately by saying everyone's going to think that's too stupid. Well, maybe everyone is, but what's said in any case is pretty stupid. Uh, can't be that bad. I don't mean by this that architecture has uh, a sort of dark secrets. It's not like that. It is that normally the past is dealt with architecturally, in a way, through innovation. One way of looking at innovation in architecture is to see it as a way not just of dealing with problems of the past, but actually making the past visible. Right. Indeed, I would say that one of the important elements of any definition of what is new is that whatever is new has to be strong enough to transform the past. Right? Now, that argument, in a sense, is very obviously true in the case of a human being, but I think it's equally true in the case of a practice like architecture, including the question as to whether there should be a practice called architecture. You know, you, anyone could imagine a hypothesis that says architecture is just a sort of defensive reaction against doing what it should be doing which is this. I'm not saying that's a case. But certainly innovation is one way of opening up the past. And it seems to me there are strong works <coughs> of scholarship <coughs> that in a sense exceed the discipline from which they've come, and where their innovation is undoubtedly because they reformulate the past. I think at the moment, in kind of 
an alternative architectural history, you can see being forged, I mean, I won't go into it this evening, but a kind of interest in the general context of the medium, of the media through which architecture has evolved. I mean, without saying anything about tomorrow's conference, it seems to me that anyone who was concerned with the relationship of Derrida to design, whatever that, whatever answer you gave, would actually mean investigating the architecture of antiquity, of Greek and Roman architecture, in terms of it being, in the case, say, of Greece, an architecture in a culture into which writing has just been introduced. Now, I'm not going to come up with some answer, but I do know in my bones that we have yet to see the work which will show how Greek architecture was linked in many different ways to the emergence of writing. In a sense, of course, in the case of the introduction of printing, we've seen an aspect of that work already put forward in the writings of Mario Capo as a way of showing how a technological innovation such as the engraving becomes the medium actually of the formation of the classical tradition, i.e. the classical tradition is not something that happened in Greece and Rome. It's something that happened in the 16th century as a result of the development of the printing press. That seems to be work which is able to interrogate the past in a way which is much more um, satisfying than through the question of uh, sort of periods and, and styles. So I'm suggesting in a way <clears throat> that architectural history in its conventional form would probably be better to, in a sense, dissolve as something you just ought to do, and I don't know why, but I'm sure it makes you. I mean, the real answer there is given by Alberti, who says it's very important that the architect knows all about classical myth. Why? So he can sit with aristocrats at dinner and be one of them and have something to say. I mean, you know, I don't think it's far off that. Uh, and these are not new arguments. In a sense, the, the, the past is not a topic in the conventional sense. It's not on Monday morning I'm doing a course about the past. The past is rather a problematic dimension of anything that might be studied. In a way, starting with innovation, after all. It turns out that many innovations aren't innovations. A strong innovation will have the effect of changing the past. And so, at least in this figurative sense, the problem of the subject and the problem of an academic practice throw some light uh, on each other. My last point really concerns the question of 
what some academics will think of as truth. They say, yes, but the historian has access to like what you might call true statements about the past. All this other stuff, we don't know whether it's true or not. Well, I'm sort of tempted to reply, no, we don't. <laughs> uh, I mean, Foucault used to be extremely funny on why it was the rules for the production of truth statements about history. I mean, when you read them, they actually seemed very implausible. Like your evidence must be taken from the person or the source which is closest to the event. I mean, in the rest of life, apart from the past, that's the one person you never believe. <laughs> um, why would you start believing the person now? The truth, I think, as always, is not best dealt with as a proposition. <clears throat> you deal with truth uh, as an effect. in the sense that when someone says it, before you can even say yes, something in your body has said yes. And that's where I'm going to end it. Thank you. Um, wonderful talk. What? Wonderful talk. Thank you. I want to... Um, Ask you some stuff about Wolfram. About Wolfram and about because uh, the one thing, whether this is important or not, he styled himself as a psychologist, not a historian. He went out of his way to call himself not a historian, but a psychologist of art and art. Uh, now, in the principal, I'm not, in Renaissance and Baroque, he has this one chapter that you never see in any other history book, which is called Why, Why Styles Change. And he associates that with a change in what we might call self-consciousness. He doesn't say it that way, He's talks, but he describes each period and each the period that periodicity of styles as being associated with a specific kind of self-consciousness. And I am deeply intrigued by your idea that, that today we are aware of a past and a history. And it becomes important for us to acknowledge that both of these are part of our uh, understanding of our discipline. But for example, it, that would not have been true in the Enlightenment period. It would have been very difficult for someone in the Enlightenment to, to, to understand that they had a history and a past. So difficult, for example, that contemporary art historians are saying that, that um, Rembrandt was incapable of painting a self-portrait because there was not a well-formed idea of itself at the time. In fact, and so they go back and show that Thrones. So I'm really curious about, are you interested in the question of the stylistic, of breaking down the stylistic periodicity, or in deepening the understanding of what that is an evidence, a symptomatic or forensic or, or indexical evidence of something else that might be worthwhile, which would unite, which would unite the history with a case? Yes? Yes, I mean, I'm not sure if I can answer all the points. I mean, Verflin, I mean, you're right to point out that his idea of a change in style is a change in self-consciousness, and in a way, he goes one step further because he's concerned, actually, that the, the change from one to the other is a change not just of consciousness, but of what he would, roughly what he would think of as body image. That's why actually, um, and I had a student who did a thesis on, on Verflin, and she went to the archives, and actually, especially in the early years, he was very interested in costume. I mean, uh, the history of, of clothing because he thought that that you could that the history of clothing 
sort of cut to the chase of what they thought about their bodies even more quickly than painting did. So, you know, there, there was a certain privileged uh, space given to the idea of the history of dressing to recapture, in some sense, the body image of, well, both the painter and the viewer. Uh, there was a slightly comic moment in art history departments about 25 years ago when they suddenly thought it was unbelievably avant-garde to rebaptize the discipline as something like the history of visuality. You know, like, we don't just do old master paintings. We try to recapture how the people saw. And really, that was explicitly Verflin's aim in the first place. Uh, I mean, I don't think that the history of visuality wanders away from its 19th century origins very far. Uh, it doesn't, certainly doesn't seem to me to have a characteristic of real change. But so, yes, the, the second part, I mean, I think the interest as to whether, you know, in a sense, after a while, the past can come back and re-inhabit the, what you might call the, the purely historical, uh, is for me a question that I think is, is I, I don't know the answer to, that because the question really is, I've already made what you might call a comparison between the subject and like a discipline. And I'm aware of all the difficulties that you can get involved when you do that. I mean, after a while, you can begin to seem like a complete fool. Uh, I don't mind that so much. Um, the question really is that, you know, the, the status of the discipline as being made up of objects and bits of subjectivity, how they all articulate as having a past. So it's really partly an investigation as to whether institutions and practices can have some parallel to subjective forms of relating, relationships. But I'm extremely, you know, I, I don't feel remotely confident in being able to, to make the bridge. When you see people do it, you know, confidently and without a sense of difficulty, then you're seeing a fool. <laughs> Only people speak with absolute confidence are American. <clears throat> oh, right. Right. Um, I don't think this question gets to the question of the subjectivity, but it does. I mean, I thought, but maybe this never happened in architecture, this uh, question for me as well, in a way, is that, that we get away with the history of objects and styles. and quite some time ago that what we substituted for that was um, the history of, uh, of the, the bracketing of history, historiography in other words, so that we would ask the question of how is it possible to ask the sort of question uh, and, and, um, and that would condition then what you were able to say or what you were able to say about objects or subjects or those relationships through time or past. Um, so I don't, I mean, and that was definitely a little bit of an institutional innovation, historiography. It was a way of, of um, saying all, almost, it was almost a concession to a kind of, hmm. uh, you know, to a movement, a theoretical movement, hmm. let's say, that decided that everything was going to be uh, dealt with in a, in a you know, uh, uh, destabilized object uh, sort of manner. 
And history said, well, we're not getting rid of the object, but we will ask questions about history. Um, and uh, and so I don't I don't know whether that would, you consider that significant or no. Uh, sorry, absolutely. I I think indeed uh, your point kind of supplies a, a missing. Uh, part in my argument. I mean, at one level, if my memory serves me in a sense, uh, there was a moment when people would insist, I'm not talking about history, I'm talking about historiography. Now, whatever arguments they brought to that, they also brought, they wanted to tell you, I know I'm supposed already to feel anxious about just talking directly about history. So historiography became, you know, almost like the graduate term for history. Uh, I mean, it's like undergraduates continued to use history. Uh, graduates would say historiography. Um, precisely because, you know, there's a, a, certain, a certain recognition of trouble. I think the problem is the the, the historiography move is a certain uh, kind of, it's just a holding pattern, really. Uh, because either you're saying, I'm concerned with the history of how history has been presented, historiography, or I'm concerned with how the past has been represented as history. But then the next stage means then you better get on and look at what the past is. Which doesn't even have to be thought of as the past. Um, and I think in many ways people still haven't, historians still haven't recovered from the attack on the theoretical status of their discipline, which was made by Levi-Strauss, all those years ago. But I think, well, and Foucault, but I, I really think that Levi Strauss is uh, what you might call magisterial and, you know, just, just cuts Sartre off. I fail to see how you can read the controversy and not recognize. Uh, that Levi Strauss kind of wins. On the other hand, every day you meet more and more historians who think that's completely wrong. But certainly the, it, it would be fair to say, so I'm not very kind of encouraged to say it, uh, that, that the object history is an anxious one after Levi Strauss. I mean, on, I, I mean, I think Foucault was loathed by historians to start with, and then very quickly became canonized. So it's a bit, it's always a bit difficult. You used to read, uh, used to read the, the, the history and the past. And you are also saying that uh, you would like to give up the category, categorization, the category, periodization of the history. And I think that this question to me is very important for another reason, because I think that you are trying to find in the history the blood of the past. So to find the real blood for a given that still are in the, in the past, but they are alive in the present time. This is not a question of a more deeper critique to the, our modern thought today, because our knowledge today is splitting everything. And when you, when you ask the body to be again, to to play a, a different role in, instead of mind. And you expect, expect from the experience to be something more vivid. 
in our knowledge. This is not a real tough critique to our Western thought, because our Western thought is just the specialization of everything, excluding the real experience. Because we are not able anymore to find the blood in what we are doing. I don't know if I did a good or wrong very question. Very yes, very poetic. Yes, very So, on the book. Uh, I, I, I'm, maybe I'm just not very good on blood. I mean, uh, it, it, always feel, it always feels a bit sort of operatic. You feel it's true before you say it's true. Yes. I mean, I'm, I'm, yes, I'm certainly, I'm certainly, uh, I mean, I think the, the question of truth uh, I mean, I'm absolutely happy to agree with Nietzsche. I mean, it's it's not a kind of propositional issue. It's a it's somatic. I mean, it's the experience in psych. You know, if if someone asks, who's usually hostile, how does the patient know if an interpretation is true or false? Uh, I mean, I guess my answer is it's the same way that you know anything is true or false. I want to state this question in more legal terms. Um, what is your goal? I mean, in a certain sense, he, let's say it may be not fighting the existential blood or the phenomenological, you know, the truth. But one thing I think is interesting is you actually never said what the goal would be in changing the way we teach history from a historical model to a model that either is about or includes the past. What, what would be the after effect? What would be, what are, the, what are your ex expectations of the effect of such a shift? Is that for you? If I know, I'm not telling. <laughs> 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 can, we, can we have another question? This is going to come like a footnote question then, in the, the after that you just said, but is it then? I, I, I think maybe what you were talking about it, so also about the shift from kind of a, looking at the style and the, the viewing, but trying to find a way how to, of including uh, actually teaching conditions of production of architecture in the discourse. Because we are always taught. Uh, the elements and, and how an object is how it, it exists and how it maybe behaves in the space. But we are rarely taught on how the object, uh, conditions of the productions of the object, and then how this object produces, continues to produce, for example, society around. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm trying to, to... I suppose to grasp the, the question. I mean, I, I think what, what's making it difficult for me is this word production, which I'm not sure... Uh, the, the word production has, has, a, has a part, I mean, you could write a history of the concept of production, all the books that it appears in. But the history of production has actually, to use the formulation just used, it's got blood on its hands. Uh, production has, uh, is, is, is like a, a verbal way of saying there's something particular it's got something to do with doing something, something to do with making something, but in a kind of more discipline, disciplined way. And so 
And a discipline must have a discipline, and so when we talk about the production of knowledge, and it's across the board that it's, it's, it's to some extent neither left nor right nor whatever. But um, my first difficulty is I just, want, I just wish to express my dislike of the term production. I mean, I, I could never be friends with a word like that. Uh, and so, and that's before you get to like the theoretical stuff. I mean, the conditions of, I think, is another. I mean, I don't think I'm very good on the conditions of sorts of questions. I have, I just want, oh, I'm all I, I just was, um, The, um, I was just thinking about what you were saying at the beginning of your talk. Uh, also, I don't want to—I don't want to get off the question of production. If you want to, you know, that, to stay there, but it, uh, I mean, I you know the reason that architects find um, not just uh, sort of old-style history, but maybe even new-style history uh, somewhat problematic might be because if you uh, look closely at his had many, many historians' treatment of the object, you can tell they're not looking at it. And that for an architect, and I would say what the architect does is look at the object, and that there's some kind of discrepancy between those two uh, versions of looking. I mean, there's many, many theories of looking, obviously. Uh, yeah. yeah. But that, the, but that uh, a number, you know, architects do not find what they see in the historical account in some way, or what they are looking at, is not in the historical account. Uh, the historical account, in fact, uh, art historians and architectural historians are notorious for just broad <laughs> sweeps, you know, of sort of putting their hand over the entire facade and saying, this is the, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so it's like there's not a kind of, um, the object, in fact, is a fearful thing, I think, for historians. like. Uh, you know, they can't go into it. I think the uh, I think the object is a pretty fearful thing for architects, but in a different way. I agree. I mean, on the first point, uh, that these authors don't look. I learned only the other day uh, that Lessing's article on the Lao Kun, this kind of canonical piece of writing, he'd never seen it. Uh, it is presumed he'd seen a kind of an engraving, uh, but he'd certainly never seen the Lao Kun. Now, Actually, it, it brings me to a very precise memory because what academics obviously mostly saw were photographs. Now, I did my graduate training at the Warburg Institute, which had a very uh, unusual and impressive photographic library of many, many images which you don't see in art history libraries. And there were discussions in about 1970, 71, when everyone talked about this kind of absolute technological revolution that was going on, uh, which was at the Warburg, where small things had big effects. Uh, it was the introduction of the slide. <laughs> And so there are discussions, you know, should, should, should the library move from black and white photographs to the slide? And most people are, no, this slide thing, it'll, it'll you know, pass in a couple of years. No, one, no one's really going to take that. It's, I mean, it's a photograph, for heaven's sake. Of course, all photographs were black and white. And then the young photographic librarian said, well, you know, also, of course, we could have them in color. 
At this point, there was really horrified silence around the room. Uh, there was only one person, the director, Ernst Gombrich, who, who was, would yield to anyone, who was a, an astonishing scholar who only ever published, I think, one article called Some Folding Chairs in the Middle East, 1115 to 1125. Uh, now, he said, but the color will be awful. And they say, no, the color's really quite good. No, I don't, I don't like color. And he said, you're supposed to study Western art. He said, I know. I wish all Western art had been in black and white. <laughs> Which, you know, kind of pretty much, I think that there was a generation of art historians who probably would rather have, you know, just had the black and white photograph. You know, why go to all this business of commissioning, painting, doing it on walls. Just give us the photo. Okay. Uh, please, I would like to ask you to, to tell some words about the way to develop uh, the problematic dimension of past. Because uh, I was very much impressed by uh, the way you described uh, the depressed uh, students when they have to to learn story in a way, or theory, because it's uh, not enough uh, mm. experience. But could you explain, uh, to tell some work, how to develop this kind of education about the problematic of past? Yes. I mean, that seems to me uh, a central and difficult question. I wouldn't have time to, to, to do you the to show you the respect of answering it in detail. For me, the question, in a sense, becomes how can you reconfigure the time of history in a way which abandons what you might call uh, the sort of prosthesis of chronology and so it, it's like trying to think about time but without having without a concept of time how would you begin to explain the passage of time if you had taken on the kind of discipline of not using a concept of time. I think in a sense, and it obviously moves on to questions which will be there in the conference, it's about the way in which everything is like reappropriated. As if then, uh, the past isn't a kind of mute, passive survivor, but that which is, it's, re it's reconstructed before it's ever been constructed. It is the process of something which always and only is reconstruction. Now, immediately a historian would say, oh, in that case, how can you talk about this mechanism of reconstruction? Aren't you a part of it? But those are the kinds of questions you always get. The answer is, I don't know. Uh, but it's really about, and of course, it, it, it means, in some sense, giving the passage of time displacing something of what we've come to call the temporal in favor of something which initially looks rather like the spatial. Maybe I would like to ask something. Uh, something about not historical past. 
that you are mentioning all the time. Is it a capacity to think when you, for example, notice some problem in architecture today, and in that case, should we look into the past then to find out how sometimes somebody else is trying to find a solution to, to that problem? So is it uh, possible to, to ever to look into the past and looking for something for you? The difficulty is that you can, you can't really look for something in the past. All you can do is find it uh, or not find it. I mean, uh, when we are engaged in a historical inquiry, you know, which is a sort of super elaborate form of police work, uh, we know exactly what we're looking for. I mean, knowing what we're looking for is the condition for finding it. Maybe we could sort of maintain the parallel with the police. I mean, it seems to me the exception within that field is to some extent the amateur uh, detective who's really looking for, not looking for, but, but sort of, in a way, aimlessly hanging around until something, something strikes the person as a clue. I mean, I think, in a sense, the amateur detective knows it's a clue long before they know what the clue means. That means that the object has a certain kind of almost, to put it physically, a sort of finish on it, which is that it's, it's a clue. It's a clue, you know, which is prepared to stand up in court. Uh, I, in some sense, evidence and clues are, are opposed to each other. Um, But like a lot of things, you know, you feel you've really specified it when you just call it it. Uh, I mean, a lot of academic life, it seems to me, consists to providing alternative words for it. You know, like in this field of life, we give you a job and you will find more and more words for if. I mean, I think it takes up your point. Uh, and of course, in academic life or professional life in general, you can't say, you know, only when I left the library did I have a profound sense of it overtake me and I couldn't eat my dinner. You know, it's, it's, you know that shouldn't be in a thesis. Although I think we ought to struggle to put it there. Not on grounds that it's personal, on the grounds that it's strictly impersonal. Okay, just to tell us something else of what? Uh, how do you teach architectural history? Literally. I mean, what do you say to students? <laughs> I'm sorry I won't be able to give the lecture because I'll be in Belgrade. <laughs> That's what I said this week. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Kadi, uh, and all of you, and see you tomorrow early in the morning. Thank you.